If a skyline represents the city itself, what does it say about a place when an unsightly abomination, such as Chicago's lost Robert Taylor Homes, arises? Well, the answer is surprisingly complex, leading modern city authorities to demolish an entire neighborhood. Even so, its memory runs deep. So join us as we discover the history of the Robert Taylor Homes. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. The Robert Taylor Homes were a state-sponsored housing project with little industrial relevance, but a dark legacy all the same. But to better understand, let's head back to the south side of Chicago in the mid-20th century. By this time, nearly three-quarters of black Chicagoans lived in a single series of neighborhoods in the south side called the Black Belt. These houses were generally in rough shape, many were decrepit, falling apart and virtually uninhabitable. In fact, as a measurement of how bad the problem was, infant mortality in the Black Belt was 16% higher than anywhere else in Chicago from 1940 to 1960. Civil infrastructure and basic living standards were not being met, so eventually the city could no longer ignore this problem, as higher community members carried the fight. Robert Rochin Taylor was born in April of 1899 and through willpower, grit, and intellect became the first black member of the Chicago Housing Authority. His status and title would eventually rise to that of chairman where he advocated for years for his fellow neighbors and friends who were abused and cast aside on Chicago's South Side. He's also notable for having created the Illinois Federal Savings and Loan Bank to support the community by mortgaging new homes and services as more established banks wouldn't accept their proposals and the housing authority offered exorbitant rates. Presiding as the Chicago Housing Authority at the time when over 90% of the new Chicago Housing Authority projects focused on black occupants. In his eyes, however, quite realistically, Taylor believed that not enough was being done. He also believed that new housing projects for black residents should be scattered across the entire city at a nearly equal rate, a concept that was outright refused by the powers at large. Segregation and redlining continued for years, even during his time at the Chicago Housing Authority. They did not disperse the black belt, rather they seemed to enforce it. Taylor, now growing old with his health degrading, resigned from the Chicago Housing Authority in 1950. He continued to work until his final resignation from the board four years later. In that time, Chicago was expanding in some unusual ways, hence he argued that clearing neighborhoods to construct belt roads, highways, and even school grounds had been counterproductive and displaced even more black Chicagoans than any housing project possibly could assist. In fact, these issues are what most believe led to his final resignation. He'd pass away just three years later and would have been horrified if he'd known what the Chicago Housing Authority would do in his legacy. As you'll see in the coming chapter, this story really underlines how unpredictable life can be, perhaps a harsh reminder to prepare for the worst challenges with a good life insurance policy. Our sponsor, Policy Genius, gives you a smarter way to find and buy the right coverage for you and your family. As a proud father and husband, I have had a policy for years, and Policy Genius helped me confirm that it was the best choice. Policy Genius was built to modernize the life insurance industry. Their technology makes it easy to compare life insurance quotes from America's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price. With Policy Genius, you can find life insurance policies that start at just $25 per month for $1 million of coverage. Some options offer coverage in as little as a week and avoid unnecessary medical exams. Their licensed agents work for you, not the insurance companies. That means they don't have an incentive to recommend one insurer over another, so you can trust their guidance. There are no added fees and your personal details are private. So it's no wonder that they have thousands of five-star reviews on Google and Trustpilot. Your loved ones deserve a financial safety net. You deserve a smarter way to find and buy it. So head to policygenius.com slash its history or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how much you can save. In 1960, construction began on a massive public housing campaign in the South Side. 
The city's housing authority planned to build 4,415 homes and apartment blocks in the rapidly constricting neighborhood. At the time, housing campaigns like this were commonly called the projects. Across the United States, they were rather common in populated areas. Actually, cities have them in rather high quantities, but these Chicago projects would take on a whole new size and capacity. Starting with the projected three years of construction, the campaign would tear down an estimated 95 acres of the Black Belt slum housing. In their view, it was a matter of containing a problem already long out of hand. Hence, the Chicago Housing Authority said it was taking a new approach. Chief of the board, Alvin E. Rose, said, quote, A new design and fresh approach in site planning will make this development one of the city's most attractive and livable communities. It was a sprawling complex of 28 buildings, most six stories tall. The program also included a community recreation building, a management and maintenance center, and heating and power for the neighborhood. The first apartments were opened for use in 1962 and were sizable, so many out-of-luck Chicagoans could now afford rent. So how did this project develop as it was opened? Was everything Rose proclaimed true and did it improve the community? The short answer is no. The long answer is that it probably made things much worse. Let me explain. Once the buildings were all completed, the project was planned to have a combined population of 11,000. The number exploded beyond that thanks to how many houses were torn down in this and previous building efforts. Just two years after construction wrapped, the total population was around 27,000. Just as Robert Taylor himself predicted, poor planning and space management had dislocated so many people that the project's capacity couldn't adequately contain them, and it gets worse than that. Many apartments did have as many as four bedrooms, which was more than enough for your average family, but the majority of units were much smaller and housed large families. The limited space was felt across the entire complex, and to make matters worse, many families had a paper-thin budget for food and necessities. If they faced an emergency, they had no way to survive financially. There were also ways for families to be forcibly removed. For example, in October of 1966, Rose made it a policy that habitually truant students would get their families evicted from the apartments. This was easily monitored given that the projects had been zoned so that the kids from the projects attended the same K-12 schools. As you're probably imagining, this did meet a lot of resistance from residents. The defense attorney for the 58 evicted families argued in the following December that the policy grossly violated state and federal due process laws and expedited the process against families who could not afford a lengthy court battle. Approximately 95% of inhabitants were unemployed or survived off social services. Poverty in these apartment blocks was some of the worst in Chicago, if not the entire country. Yet some estimates have it that thousands of dollars in drug deals occurred in the buildings, but the sourcing I saw for this was sketchy at best. But what we do know for certain is that the crime there was completely unchecked, as there wasn't a police station close to the projects until over a decade after construction. But what about Elvin Rose's claim that the community would be one of Chicago's most attractive when finished? Well, I'll let you be the judge here. Look at these buildings. Flat, featureless, and dull. They give some of the housing blocks in the USSR a run for their money. Perhaps the only positive aspect of this project was the reported communal feeling of cooperation between many residents. The YMCA and rec center were open for classes and leisure to the whole neighborhood, and several community members helped clean and manage small gardens and farm plots for vegetables and food. I should also point out that many first-hand accounts I've read on this topic regard the projects as a community and family that appreciated and worked together, even so. The entire housing project was destined to crumble. What isn't in doubt is the lack of maintenance and social services in the projects. Budgets eventually shrank for keeping the building in order, and things began to decay rapidly. Elevators habitually broke or were sabotaged. Many became the scenes of assaults and muggings. When the elevators weren't traps for assaults, they could be dangerous on their own. 
not having safety sensors and doors strong enough to break bones if caught inside when closing. Oh, and the emergency button didn't work either. There's more than one account of residents forcing open the topside escape hatch and banging on the shaft walls for help. Some hallways had visible burn marks from attempted arson. Garbage chutes were jammed or broken, scattering litter across the homes, halls, and streets. Electric installations broke or just lost power, and the modern appearance of the apartment building became, for some tenants, nothing but a lie. Barely any better than the sprawling slum neighborhoods that the projects replaced. There were also issues with food supply and social dependency checks. Even when checks for families arrived, they were small and arrived only week to week or less often than that. Many families were single parents and had no breadwinners either. So food was regularly in short supply and decent grocers were not within reasonable distances. One of the many impacts this environment had was on students' education. We already mentioned habitual truancy, but school surveys also determined that the education district for the projects had lower average English and reading grades than that of the rest of the city. The principal of Farron Elementary School told the Chicago Tribune that, quote, the homes aren't oriented towards education, and that during lunch periods, in all schools, students were regularly seen wandering the campus without having home or school lunches. The lacking infrastructure was extreme, and although the area had several social facilities nearby, no police or fire department were on that list. Resident Eddie Lehman recalled, quote, Growing up, I never saw ambulances. Police would have significantly delayed responses if they showed up at all, and patrols? Those weren't common either. By the 1980s, the Taylor Project was a unique breeding ground for juvenile delinquency and gang crime. Tension with the police ran high, and Rose's plan to virtually isolate large neighborhoods of thousands of people with no way to progress socially or economically led to a more aggravated reaction than he could have ever imagined. Young men and teenagers, rightfully mad with the situation the Chicago government had actively put them in, were a breeding ground for crime and discontent. The consequences weren't just bloody, they were deadly. In an article from August of 1970, the New York Times reported that in the past month, three Chicago police officers were killed at nearby projects like the Taylor Homes, and seven had died similarly the previous year. Hence, some feared that the amount of bitter young men could start literal urban warfare against the police and the city officials. Even in one July incident, when shooters assassinated two officers on the sixth floor, when their fellow officers tried to recover them, they had to use M16s to suppress the high-rise gunfire aimed at them. When the attacks weren't lethal, they were still throwing trash, bricks, bottles, and heavy objects within arm's reach. Police weren't the only casualties either. Gangs were fighting and many got caught in the crossfire. From one block to others, young men, children, adults, and passerbyers were gunned down or attacked with alarming frequency. While this eventually settled down slowly and with several further incidents, it was clear from the city's perspective that the projects were a failure. This will be hard to believe, but by the 90s, things were even worse. The buildings had decayed significantly, maintenance was high, the crime was still an issue, with at least a third of Project Boys in rival gangs. Blocks in Robert Taylor had a vacancy rate of 20 to 40 percent, meaning the projects were at the point of no return. One reporter compared life here to being in a submarine, entirely isolated in the harshest of conditions. After just 30 years, the city government decided the projects had to go. Residents that couldn't afford new housing independently moved to other projects across the city or left the projects for private dwellings with Section 8 certificates. These documents thankfully guaranteed that 34,000 displaced residents could rent private homes proportionate to 30% of their income. The rest was covered by the Federal Housing and Urbanization Program, HOPE 6. Plans were drawn up for the new housing complexes, community centers, and shopping centers to replace the apartment blocks once torn down. Between 1997 to 2005, 
Residents gradually moved out as the new project was put forward. By 2007, the last block was demolished. So where exactly does that leave us? Well, without putting things in absolutes, there's no way of denying that the Robert Taylor homes were a shamefully failed project for the Chicago Housing Authority. Bruce Katz, president of the Washington DC based Brookings Research Institute said he was happy they were coming down. Quote, they shouldn't have been built the way they were built. They were a recipe for disaster. No one should have had to grow up in an environment like that. Frankly, I see little room to argue. The projects were poorly designed, underfunded, and critically mismanaged. They created an environment where simply getting in the elevator was a risk to your safety. It accidentally encouraged drug dealing, juvenile delinquency, and gang rivalry. Activities which perhaps Chicago didn't need any encouragement to lean towards. While the community that lived in the Taylor homes made the best of it collectively, even raising some well-known figures, including athletes, comedians, and Mr. T, they were all raised through a system that should have never existed. The result was a community torn by crime and poverty. The question is whether or not the Robert Taylor homes were designed poorly on purpose, but I'll let you be the judge on that in the comment section. I'd also be curious if any of you watching this have your own stories from the projects. The south side of Chicago is an interesting, yet at times very dangerous place, with many stories to be discovered, such as the story of Chicago's lost yellow street signs, a video which you can watch by clicking right here. It's one of my favorites. Thank you all for watching. Until next time, this is Ryan Sokash, signing off.